Welcome to this week's edition of podcast Bridging Voices. Today we are discussing business and human rights innovations in the EU and Latin America. My name is Caroline Löbrich and I am Program Manager for Democracy and Sustainable Development at the Multinational Development Policy Dialogue of Konrad Adenauer Stiftung in Brussels. On July 1st, we organized a webinar together with our colleagues from the Rule of Law Program for Latin America in Bogota to find out how the European Union can support Latin American partners in their efforts to implement the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights. How can judicial and non-judicial access to remedy, due diligence and accountability be driven forward in Latin America? And where are current obstacles on the road to full implementation of responsible business conduct? These are just some of the questions that we discussed with our experts from Europe and Latin America. Good morning um, and, after, and good afternoon to everybody connected from um, either Latin America or from Europe. I'm very excited um, to see the list of inscriptions with participants from over 25 countries all over the world. So really a miracle what uh, Zoom technique can, can do for us. On behalf of Konrad Adenauer Foundation, a very warm welcome to today's online seminar on business and human rights innovations in the EU and Latin America. At the beginning, of course, a very special thank you to our speakers from the EU, OECD, Mexico, and Colombia, with my, uh, which my colleague Caroline will present in a minute. Obviously, to our audience and to our colleagues from the CAS Brussels Office of Multinational Development Policy for the excellent coordination organization or co-organization of, of this event. I will shortly present myself. My name is Marie-Christine Fuchs. And since four years, I'm the director of the Rule of Law Program for Latin America of Conrad Adenauer Foundation with its headquarters in Bogota, Colombia, um, but which has a regional focus. So we are basically working um, all throughout the continent. And this, um, for 30 years, the program was founded 30 years ago. So I think we've built up quite a network. And this is um, also our main function. We are a network and dialogue program on topics like constitutional, um, public international law, laws of indigenous peoples, various topics. I think basically with the adoption of the end guiding principles for business and human rights, the topic grew more relevant, not only in Europe, but also in Latin America. And then this is when on the rule of law program, but I think all over the foundation, we started to work on the topic um, because um, the issue is a priority in the understanding that economic actors such as companies play an important role in strengthening our democracies and consolidation of the rule of law throughout the world. With this public event, we conclude a three days digital dialogue program between European and Latin American experts on the subject of business and human rights. On Monday, we were talking to two German parliamentarians on supply chain law, on the yeah. draft law, um, which is currently discussed in the Deutsche Bundestag. Um, to, uh, yesterday, we talked to uh, two members of DG Trade about HR clauses in um, EU trade agreements. And today, we are culminating um, this digital program um, with this excellent public um, webinar. Originally, we, uh, we were supposed to travel with a group of 14 Latin American experts uh, to Europe um, to see um, all of you in person, but for obvious reasons, this hasn't been possible. So we are really glad that this miracle um, of Zoom technique allows us to um, be connected this way. As of today's subject under discussion, the issue of business and human rights, uh, I think it's highly complex <laughs> only because of the multiple actors that involve it, companies, states, civil society, academia, um, in Latin America, also indigenous people, vulnerable groups um, in the most, um, yeah, in, this, in the mo most widest sense. But also because of the complex cross-border business relations, many of them are a result of the globalization, which entail manifold supply chains throughout the world. And it's not for nothing that this discussion, the topic is discussed in Germany at the moment, not only in Germany, I think also at EU level. 
Europe and Latin America, as other regions throughout the world, face various challenges on the subject. These challenges can be located basically around the three guiding principles of business and human rights of the United Nations, which I don't want to repeat over here. I think the experts will elaborate on this uh, due diligence, um, straight responsi uh, state responsibility, compensation of victim victims, either judicially or extrajudicially. In order to comply with these principles, um, various Amer Latin American and also European states in close collaborations with companies, civil society, academia, have developed public policies, then translated in many cases into laws on business and human rights, either to regulate a specific business activity or to strengthen the judicialization mechanisms of these cases. Likewise, they have also started the iteration of NAPS, National Action Plans on Business and Human Rights, in order to harmonize the regulation on the subject at the level of solid public policies. But we all know that despite these advances in initiatives by the various actors mentioned, the issue still needs to be further strengthened in order to harmonize business activities and the necessity, the obvious necessity of companies to be profitable and competitive, which is obviously not easy in times of COVID-19, with full and effective respect for human rights and indigenous people's rights, the promotion of sustainable development, protection of the environment, in order to combat the climate change. In this sense, I think this online seminar um, is a perfect space, a uh, creative workspace, in which we would like to shed light and gather and exchange ideas on innovations in upcoming topics in the business and human rights discussion on both sides of the ocean in order to search for creative solutions all around the world. And I'm really happy that um, on this, using this technique, um, we can bring together uh, two continents, uh, which sometimes seems to world apart, but they can really get a little more, more closer uh, using this webinar technique today. With this introductory words, I will pass on the words, uh, the floor to my colleague, Caroline Dubrich. Thank you. Well, thank you, Marie, for your introduction and welcome everybody from my side, from Brussels to our today's seminar, webinar. My name is Caroline Lüttrich. Um, I'm Program Manager for Democracy and Sustainable Development at the Multinational Development Policy Dialogue of Konrad Adenauer Foundation here in Brussels. Um, our office implements and facilitates the dialogue between the EU and partners from the Global South on sustainable development with a focus on the nexus of peace and security, climate and democracy, of course. And we believe that democracy can only flourish when fundamental and, and human rights are protected um, and that respect for human rights is a precondition for sustainable development and the implementation of the Agenda 2030 as a whole. So um, in the framework for, um, of discussions on the future EU budget, we have, for example, together with the European Network of Political Foundations and others developed a set of recommendations on democracy support on, um, in EU external programming. And we, have also, um, we are also currently working on a statement on the new EU action plan on human rights and democracy. At the same time, we are researching the impact of the EU's free trade agreements and their trade and sustainable development chapters in order to advise on how trade tools can be used more efficiently to achieve development goals. And in all these activities, it becomes quite clear how important uh, the role of business and enterprise are in safeguarding human rights. Um, so we know that these issues will also play a big role in the German presidency of the Council of the European Union, which starts today. Um, and besides a number of issues and changing priorities, um, it has been mentioned that the presidency wants to, for example, ratify the Mercosur Agreement by December 2020, um, but also review existing agreements with Mexico and Chile. Uh, we in Brussels will, of course, closely follow and analyze uh, the presidency's external dimension. So we consider the discussion today very timely and important, and we are excited to team up with our colleagues from the Rule of Law program in Latin America for this debate. And without further ado, I would like to um, introduce our excellent speakers today um, in the order of uh, 
them speaking. Uh, we first have Bruce Hautoin, who is a senior advisor on trade issues at uh, the European External Action Service and chair of the OECD Multi Stakeholder Steering Group. Welcome, Bruce. Thank you, um, Caroline. Then we also um, are joined by Frau Kibole, who is manager for Latin America and the Caribbean at the OCD Center for Responsible Business Conduct. Um, welcome, Frauke. Um, then we are joined today by Humberto Cantu Rivera, who is vice president um, of the Global Business and Human Rights Scholars Association and executive director of the Institute of Human Rights and Business at the University of Monterrey, Mexico. And last but not least, we are with Diana Carolina Olarte Bacares, who is the Dean of the Faculty of Law um, at the University of Bogota in Colombia. Welcome, Carolina. So without further ado, I would like to jump straight into the discussion. And Chus, the floor is yours. Thank you, Caroline. Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me at this Konrad Arnauer event and uh, welcome to also the, uh, the, the participants uh, to this webinar. Uh, I hope you're all coping with the, with the current crisis uh, to the best of your abilities. Well, very, very short then. I think you're all aware uh, uh, it's one of uh, at least those uh, participating from Latin American countries that there is an EU partnership instrument uh, project on responsible business conduct in nine Central and Latin American countries, as well as a project, also EU project, partnership instrument on empowerment of women at work through responsible business conduct. But I will not take the floor from Frauke. I think most of the experience will come from Frauke and the other speakers. I rather sketch the, the current landscape, the EU landscape on responsible business conduct. Obviously, I have to start with the 2020 2024 EU action plan on human rights and democracy, uh, just published, with a number of important, I would say, business and human rights, responsible business conduct tasks for the EU institutions. A number of them. It's an engagement with the business. We basically, as institutions, committed ourselves to engaging with the business sector and upholding and promoting human rights yeah, on corporate social responsibility, on due diligence, on accountable accountability, on access to remedies. We're doing a lot, but my personal comments: we need to do a lot more. And if you go to just Google Action Plan on Human Rights Democracy 2024, and you'll find those points. And of course, we have to strengthen engagement uh, to actively promote and support partner countries' efforts to implement the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, uh, including, as, as our colleague, of course, from Mexico and Colombia will know, uh, through national action plans and relevant due diligence guidance. We're doing that and also supporting multi-stakeholder process to develop, implement, and strengthen the standards and engage with international uh, financial institutions, development banks notably, and promote regional projects and all that, but I won't go into the detail. We're doing that, but I must, on the third point, you'll see that once you open the document, not enough yet. And again, we, we want to have enhanced business engagement in decent job creation, sustainable development and related advocacy work along the supply chain. There we are a relative novice, I would say, at that line of work. So your advice on how best, again, I invite participants to react, on how best to do that would be more than welcome. And with, in these COVID-19 times, you may sometimes have trouble sleeping at night. Well, an easy solution would be to read the commissions staff working document on corporate social responsibility on responsible business conduct and on business and human rights are oh, now more than a year old 20 march 20th of march 2019 number 143 if you're looking via electronic means but this illustrates the many things the eu is doing when it comes to legislation when it comes to measures when it comes to financing it may not be presented in the most public relation-like way, but I would say it's a fairly good document 
setting out what we are doing and why we are doing. But of course, that is a state of play document. The question, of course, you will be asking yourself, where next? And if there's one thing the COVID-19 crisis has brought for the forefront, is that responsible business conduct. And I'm using RBC in general, because we all know it's based on the guiding principles, it's based on the ILO standards, but it's a lot easier than UNGPs. And RBC is easier to pronounce. And I would like to indeed quote what the OECD published. And here I'm beginning to quote. So the OECD said, I think it was somewhere in April, that for a company observing responsible business conduct standards and implementing due diligence in response to the crisis will help ensure that its business decisions help avoid and address potential adverse impacts, including in its supply chain. And companies taking proactive steps to address the risk of COVID-19 in the way that mitigates these adverse impacts on workers, on supply chain, are also too likely to build more long-term value and resilience. So I would say the conclusion is straightforward. Resilience and responsibility go together and supply chains integrating responsible business conduct will weather the crisis better and the OECD expects, and I definitely hope it's true, that they will also recover better. And as I, as I found out also in my work for the multi-stakeholder group on the so-called conflict minerals, uh, more known in Colombia than in Mexico, we all, uh, if we're looking at gold, but the conclude, uh, it's not about cost responsible supply chains. It's about an asset and we need to change our perspective. Uh, in my capacity as chair of this OECD multi-stakeholder group, I once asked a leading EU company in the mineral sector, I put the question, what about the costs of due diligence? To which the CEO replied rather straightforward, that's the wrong question, Mr. Houghton. Think about the cost of not doing due diligence. So basically, I kept from that, we need to look at it as an asset. And I think we see a change of thinking, a change of attitude in the EU. And Trade Commissioner Hogan, Normally not the most progressive part, of course, of, of policies, uh, trade commissioners or ministries of economic affairs. I can say that because I worked for the Dutch Ministry of Economic Affairs before moving to Brussels. Uh, trade Commissioner Hogan's speech at the OECD Global Forum on Responsible Business Conduct earlier this year confirmed that sustainable value chains and due diligence will be an important part of the work, and that started two weeks ago, that work, on the EU's EU trade policy review, for which the public consultations indeed started on the 16th of June. I would invite all participants, of course, read the accompanying uh, documents. Suffice to Google EU trade policy review or Google Commissioner Hogan, but read and react because the EU's trade policy is amongst our most important windows on the world. And this is not a, just an update of a trade policy. It is more like a strategic reassessment in the light, of course, of COVID, but also in the light of changing structures uh, on, on worldwide trade. And I was quite happy that Phil Hogan also said that a truly resilient economy is one that protects workers, companies, and supply chain, and that responsible business conduct will remain hugely important for our trade agenda. So it was already there in the existing communications, but I do expect a lot more. Some perspective, I would say, compared to, let's say, five years ago, where there, the club of EU responsible business conduct evangelists, and we have internet evangelists, I, I just invented today the word RBC evangelist, uh, but that club consisted of a rather select and very small bunch dealing with conflict minerals, dealing with timber, tropical timber, dealing with the multinational enterprise guidelines and the OECD widely. But I think responsible business conduct is, has now become mainstream in the EU institutions, but also in the Foreign Affairs Council, 
uh, as, as economic action service, external action service, we addressed the Foreign Affairs Council uh, uh, in, in the fall of 2019 on this issue. And it has become mainstream in all EU member states with exporting industries. Uh, one should not forget, there is one rule about the EU. The EU is based on economics. And if there is an issue with a link between values and economics, the EU has a tendency to wake up and take action. Well, clearly, if we have national legislation, for instance, on due diligence in France, the Dutch law on, on child labor, uh, laws being considered in, uh, in Germany, therefore, with a clear risk of a disharmonization in the internal market, the EU has little choice than to act, irrespective of the reasons you already have the economic motivation. So what can you expect from the European Union? Well, of course, we see Commissioner Reinders taking due diligence forward. A study was published earlier this year, and he's spoken to Parliament and uh, other events. He will also participate, uh, I expect, at the, uh, the, the, the launching event uh, in uh, Berlin on ten, the next the 10 years, and mo mostly the 10 next years of UN guiding principles. And of course, he has mentioned a legislative proposal on cross-sectoral and mandatory due diligence. Mentioned, not a proposal yet, consultations will begin, but things are moving. Of course, we see policies on sustainable corporate governance and the review of the non-financial reporting directive. Last but not least, and that uh, is my other hat in uh, other than a trade advisor, MSG chair, there is EU legislation about responsible sourcing of minerals from conflict affected and high risk areas. And people don't realize it, but the hard obligations, mandatory due diligence, sectoral due diligence, but mandatory due diligence, that legislation affecting EU importers, EU uh, users, because there's it, this legislation, whereas the effect is on importers of metals and minerals, uh, it will spread, the actual impact for an industry spread, spreads much further downstream. And that will apply today, we're the 1st of July, so it's less than six months from now, on the 1st of January 2021, we'll have mandatory requirements. And of course, I, I, I should have mentioned trade and sustainable development, but that makes it much, much uh, uh, too long just to say about trade and sustainable development, an integral part in the EU's trade agreements. Of course, it's about respecting rights, respecting environment conventions, respecting labor conventions by our trade partners. And we have launched even a first consultation or uh, and, and, and dispute procedure with Korea on its failure to take the necessary steps towards ratifying ILO conventions and amending its labor legislation. This is of course about rights, but what I said earlier about economics is also true because our workers and also our consumers want to know, but our EU workers want to know with whom they're competing. You don't want to compete with a country where there's social dumping. You don't want to be, where, compete with a country where there's less relevant for the trade agreements, but still where there's no free press. And you don't want to compete with a country when uh, uh, there is environmental dumping. So important issues, but it, I think it would go a bit too far for today's discussion. Uh, by the way, I should end by uh, referring to the important work by the OECD give an example of what the OECD is doing, Frankie knows a lot better than I, with all Colombian stakeholders in the mining sector and the commitments by the government and the OECD to work together and use due diligence guidance in fighting illegal exports of gold from artisanal and small scale mining. People may think artisanal and small scale mining and gold, is it that important? Yes, I think because recent numbers uh, 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 demonstrate that the uh, the amounts of illegal export in, in monetary value are much much closer to what can be uh, earned by uh, export of drugs. Just to give you an example, so very very important that due diligence and a company responsibility takes off. Thank you very much. Much too long. Sorry.
No problem. Thank you very much, Gus. It was really interesting. Um, you mentioned some topics which will definitely have um, very great importance in the uh, German presidency in the council. Um, and I think you already started to build some bridges with the Latin Americans because um, especially the last topic that meant that you mentioned in legal mining and and gold um, is uh, a, yeah an issue that uh, Latin Americans have uh, to 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 face in their yeah daily. Uh, economy. But we will stay in Europe for a bit more. Um, we will give the floor to Frauke Boyle now from um, OECD. Um, Frauke, the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much, uh, Marie-Christine. And, and first of all, thank you for, for inviting us uh, me to, this, to speak at this webinar. And um, um, I also want to thank all the participants uh, from Europe and for Latin, from Latin America that are connected with a special but for those uh, in the region, uh, as you are going through particularly hard times now in, in, in facing the corona uh, crisis and in lockdown for, for way too long. Um, so um, thanks also, Gus, for, for paving the road so clearly for, for my intervention. Um, and, and thank you also, Gus, for, for setting um, uh, the things straight on, on the use of responsible business conduct and you and guiding principles. I mean, for, for us really at the OECD, just to reiterate what, what Gus was saying, is when we talk about the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, for us, this is part and parcel of the concept of responsible business conduct, like it is for the EU, as the OECD guidelines, a human rights chapter, is in line with the UN guiding principles. So also throughout my intervention, I'll be focusing on, on on the word, uh, on, on uh, using uh, responsible business conduct. Um, I would like to focus my intervention on three different points uh, for, for today's discussion. First of all, I, I want to um, give a bit of a picture of, of the state of responsible business conduct in the region and what are facts and figures uh, on RBC, um, uh, which are relevant for the promotion of, of RBC. Second of all, I would like to, on the basis of that, have a look at, okay, if we know what is the context in which, the economic context in which RBC is taking place, what are the drivers for, for responsible business conduct, specifically to Latin America, and what are the opportunities uh, and challenges? And, and lastly, um, and, and linking back to, to what uh, Ruth was also saying uh, at the start of his intervention, uh, indeed, we have a big project on responsible business conduct taking place uh, in Latin America, and I will, I will explain a bit more about what we're doing to, to address these challenges and opportunities. Now, first of all, in, in terms of uh, economic facts and figures, um, I think it's important to, to keep in mind a couple of basic economic points and, uh, uh, when, we are, when we're considering RBC in the region. Already prior to the COVID-19 outbreak, the region actually was confronting a slowdown in economic growth. So while economic growth rates in the region were certainly very high in the early 2000s, this was halted in 2009 already with the global financial crisis. And there was a bit of a rebound in 2010, but ever since uh, growth in the region, economic growth, so this is even speaking prior to COVID-19 crisis, and I'll get back to that, has already slowed down. I think this is an important fact we, we need to look at. Second of all, um, a good news is, is that, uh, again, speaking prior to the COVID-19 crisis, poverty and in in inequality had strongly declined over the past years, and poverty rates in the region actually fell from 40% in 2005 to less than 30% in 2018. Um, um, linked also to, to these economic facts is, is another one which, which is a, a bare reality, is that inequality in the region is widespread. Uh, the fact is, is that the richest 10% of the population holds at least 30% of income in, in the region, which, which we have some particularly alarming figures of inequality in Brazil, Colombia, uh, and Mexico. Um, another very important um, data point are, is informality. If we're talking about the promotion of responsible business conduct, we, we really need to, to think about informality. Because according to re recent ILO data, labor informality in the region accounts for nearly half of employment. Uh, and obviously, I mean, informality in the region is uh, unfortunately most prevalent among women, rural workers, and, and less educated workers. Um, another very important data point related to informality, if we're looking at the promotion of responsible business conduct, is um, 
the composition uh, of, of informality. Because unlike in other regions, uh, informality is high both among employees, around 45%, as well as among own account workers, uh, approximately 43%. And obviously, the, the informal economy in that sense poses major challenges to the creation of decent work in the region and, and is characterized also by limited or non-existent social protection, poor working conditions, low productivity and low wages, all these uh, factors being aggravated by the current crisis. Uh, another important point if we're talking about RBC in the region and we look, is we look at the composition of, of companies in the region and we actually see that in Latin America compared to other regions there's a very high portion of micro and small enterprises. So own account workers account for 31% of workers in the region. Uh, another 31% uh, uh, of uh, workers work in micro enterprises, around 26% in medium enterprises, and only about 11% in large enterprises. So these are important data points to take into account when we're thinking about how to target our efforts to promote RBC. And then last but not least, uh, on this first point on, on economic data points, obviously all these pre-existing um, vulnerabilities in the region relating to inequality, to informality, lack of access to social protection, protection have been aggravated in the current context. And, and we are really concerned uh, about this situation. Uh, as you may have seen, the World Bank came out last month with figures on the world economy and it, it estimated a shrink of 5.2% um, uh, of global GDP uh, as a result of, of COVID-19, but uh, estimated that Latin America and the Caribbean will be the region suffering the hardest uh, hit uh, and, and, and will suffer a, a drop of 7.2% in GDP. Um, and other in, uh, economic international institutions have come out with, with similar concerning figures. So I think this is on the first part of my intervention, the economic data that we really have to take into account and which are very specific to the region if we're talking about RBC. Now, um, secondly, um, when we think about the, how can we promote the uptake of responsible business conduct practices in the region, um, what are drivers and what can, can trigger and, 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 uh, and, and push for further responsible business uh, practices. And here I would like to make two, two observations on, on the drivers. First of all, I want to say something about the importance of trade and investment. Uh, and then secondly, I want to say something about the legal framework in Latin America in which responsible business conduct operates. So first of all, um, what is an important, uh, another important economic data point, in fact, is, is that the LAC countries depend heavily on trade and international investments. Um, historically, the LAC countries are linked to certain supply chains that are mostly for minerals, but also for agricultural products. And most products, in fact, are exported to, to the EU, uh, increasingly also to, to Asia. Um, why am I making this link to trade and investment and why is it important to responsible business conduct and, and who's has already been uh, touching on this issue? Well, first of all, RBC contrib can contribute to attracting responsible investments, which is key for growth and development of the country. And it can, but at the same time, it, through trade, it can also facilitate to insert in lack economies in the global economy in the long term and, and thereby uh, triggering uh, broader value creations. So investors uh, are increasingly basing their investment decisions, in fact, on the analysis of countries' legal and regulatory frameworks, and they take into consideration whereas these frameworks are aligned with internationally recognized principles and standards on RBC. And at the same time, there's also an important trade component, because in fact, uh, as Hus was saying, more and we see mandatory due diligence requirements popping up more and more within the, uh, uh, the EU and the EU itself, but also, also in Germany, now in, in, in the Netherlands, but also in France. And in fact, this means that for businesses that are exporting their products to these countries, they are required to carry out due diligence and to respect RBC standards, which is another push for uh, businesses in the region uh, and governments in the region and their stakeholders to, to be concerned about RBC and to, to promote its, its, its implementation. 
Um, so multinationals are increasingly deciding to, to conduct their, their businesses in countries with, with lower risk of adverse impacts and that suppliers um, observe these, these internationally recognized RBC standards. Another small link relating to trade, and, and, and who's referred to this as well, is, is that of, of uh, the sustainable development chapters in the trade agreements. Um, we see increasingly that, uh, I mean, the EU is definitely taking a leading role on, on that worldwide, that there are um, uh, higher expectations on, uh, on companies with which the EU has, um, uh, with countries with which the EU has uh, concluded trade agreement to comply with RBC standards. And this is another push to convince businesses in the region to care uh, about this topic and to take action. So in sum, on, on the point on, on this uh, driver, I mean, RBC is important for LAC countries to develop a comparative advantage and to be perceived both as a reliable investment destination and a safe place to source from. Now, a couple of uh, words now on, on the legislative framework, which I think is, an, is another opportunity, but at the same time a challenge for, for RBC in the region. What is interesting is that actually, if we look at the international instruments that underpin responsible business conduct, so in the area of human rights, labor rights, environment, and corruption, in fact, the LAC region is the country in the region in the world which has most ratification. Uh, all the majority of, of LAC countries have ratified all eight ILO fundamental conventions. Most countries have ratified, uh, they have ratified uh, between 15 to 18 of the UN human rights instruments in, in, in the areas of discrimination, social economic rights, children, etc. And the same also holds for the area of envir environment. Most countries have signed up to the Paris Agreement, to the UN Convention on Biodiversity, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, and the Kyoto Protocol. Um, and all uh, countries in the region, except for Suriname, have ratified the UN Convention Against Corruption. So that, in fact, uh, reveals a strong consensus on the importance of these international standards and they demonstrate a wide commitment of uh, LAC countries uh, uh, to, to the human rights and, and RBC agenda. Secondly, however, we see discrepancies between these commitments and the reality. A major issue in Latin America is the implementation of, of these agreements. So uh, while we see that they've been transposed into national law in, in most occasions, the the issue is that many governments, in fact, lack the capacity to effectively enforce um, enforce uh, these these rights and obligations, and and this uh, this has been a real concern for for the observance of, of responsible business conduct in the region. Um, and and these international obligations and commitment they do mark the framework in which businesses in the region uh, are are operating. Now, a last word on, on the legislative framework, which I think is important to take into account. I mean, all countries in the region have endorsed the UN guiding principles, obviously. We know, uh, and I'm sure other speakers will, will talk about that more, two countries have developed a national action plan on business and human rights, Colombia and Chile, they're actually in the process of reviewing that, and two are in, in uh, and two countries, maybe a third potentially, are in the process of developing an app. That's Peru, uh, Mexico, and Argentina. It's unclear whether the new government will, will continue uh, the development of the, of the NAP. Uh, another point related to the legislative framework is are the OECD guidelines for multinationals. Um, because uh, seven countries in the region have adhered to, to these instruments, uh, Uruguay actually will soon be the eighth country to join this group. Um, and this means that there are seven countries in the region that actually have uh, put in place a national contact point. National contact points are a unique mechanism attached to the OECD guidelines in which every country that has adhered to them needs to um, um, set up. And the NCP's role is to promote RBC in the country, but at the same time also to function as a non-judicial grievance mechanism. And I think there is an important link also with the, with the UN guiding principles and, and the NAP. So in total, we know that the NCP system has received approximately 516 cases worldwide. So we have a total of 50 NCPs, uh, of which 100 have dealt with impacts of, uh, in, in, in Latin America. Um, so while LAC NCPs uh, in the region are relatively new and need to be better known, the data shows actually a positive evolution with an increased number of cases raised in the past year. 
Um, the cases have primarily to related business impacts regarding labor and human rights chapters of the guidelines. So they're relatively new, these NCPs. Uh, they have a great potential. However, um, more needs to be done in order to strengthen uh, the NAC NCPs in the region. Uh, and this brings me actually to the, to the third point uh, and last point of my, my presentation and is to explain you a little bit more about what the OECD is doing uh, uh, to promote responsible business conduct in the region. Um, well, first of all, obviously, these seven countries in the region that are adherents are part of the, the OECD network on, on responsible business conduct and the network of NCPs. Um, and, and we provide regular assistance to them in, in, in their different functions. However, with uh, the arrival of a, of a big project in Latin America on responsible business conduct, we have managed to step up our action in the region. And Chris already talks about that. The, um, we have started uh, last year, in January last year, a four year project projects in the region together with the International Labour Organization and the UN Office of, of the High Commissioner for Human Rights to promote responsible business conduct. And this is a four-year project that is um, uh, carried out in nine countries uh, in the region, including the seven countries that have adhered to the OECD guidelines. Um, and really, I mean, it's a really remarkable project in the sense that it's the first time that these three organizations, international organizations, join forces to, to promote responsible business on the ground. And we're very grateful to the EU for, for uh, financing this, this project. Um, a last word maybe on, on what we are doing specifically on, uh, in the context of this project. Um, what we, uh, as part of the, 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 the overall project is, is placing a lot of emphasis on uh, promoting the development of national action plans. So we are also trying to support that uh, as best as, as possible from the OECD. And the OECD's uh, activities have been divided into three different pillars. So we have a, a pillar of activities that is working with governments to promote their policy framework uh, to create an enabling environment for responsible business conduct. And in this context, we are carrying out RBC policy reviews in each of the nine countries. So some of you may know that actually last Thursday, we launched our first RBC policy review in Peru. And in fact, one of the main issues that was, was highlighted is also the, 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 the importance of, of uh, sufficient capacity, enforcement capacity on the side of government to, to, to implement uh, its, its laws and regulations. And, and, and the issue of informality also came, came, uh, came forward. So the first pillar is really focusing on working with governments on strengthening their role on, on promoting uh, re responsible business conduct. The second pillar of the project is focusing on um, working with companies to promote due diligence. So here we're focusing on different sectors, the mineral sectors, agriculture sector, but also financial and garment sector. And we are carrying out a diagnostic to understand what are the RBC risks in each of the sectors. So there are these four regional Diagnostics will be coming out later this year, and on the basis of, the, of that, we'll be carrying out tailor-made capacity building with businesses to strengthen their capacity to carry out due diligence. And last but not least, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the national contact points in the region uh, also um, require strengthening, and through the project, we've managed to create a network of NAC and CPs uh, to promote peer learning, and we are um, delivering some, some tailor-made capacity building to individual NCPs to help them to strengthen the way that they are structured, how they relate, how they're liaising with other parts of government, uh, but also how they're dealing with the, the case handling function. So um, with this, uh, and I'm sorry, I might have gone a bit over time, I would like to, to close my intervention. I'm happy to respond to any questions or, or, or comments you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Frauke, for this expert view on Latin America from a new um, perspective. Um, so now we can, this was a perfect bridge building um, to the two interventions now coming uh, from Latin American experts. Um, and I really agree with you that um, not only in, in, on business and human rights, I think the biggest problem um, for um, effective human rights enforcement in Latin America is despite their um, very generous um, human rights regulations also the in some aspects uh, Latin American constitutions are way more uh, guarantees they have larger human rights catalogs than for example by far the German one but the problem really is uh, the implementation and the gap 
between the norms and reality in Latin America was this, yeah, kind of the overall issue um, throughout the continent and the implementation of the rule of law. Um, now we go uh, to Humberto Cantu. Um, he is connected uh, from Mexico, and I think he will, um, yeah, give us a little bit of more details on national action plans in Latin America and um, the, yeah, the um, current status in the different countries. So, Humberto, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mary Christine, and thank you uh, to the Conrad Adenauer Stiftung for this invitation to join. Uh, in this very interesting webinar. Thank you, uh, Gus, Frauke, and Carolina also for uh, sharing this space with me. I would like to speak today about the relevance of Pillar 1 and especially of uh, Guiding Principle 3 uh, on the normative function of states uh, in my talk. I will try to not repeat what has already been addressed and I would just like to start by uh, setting up the context a bit. And just so you know, I set up my timer if it rings, I will probably take one more minute. Please indulge me. I'll be brief, I promise. Um, we know that there have been uh, several waves of corporate responsibility. Throughout history, we're closing in on the 50th anniversary of when this uh, momentum or this uh, actual project started at the international level. And uh, currently, in my view, we are working uh, with a marked focus on highlighting the regulatory role of the state in the global economy or what I like to call as adding color to the invisible hand. Now, um, I will try not to repeat what has already been said, but we, uh, or in my view, uh, there has been, there have been three different phases, or we are looking at three different phases in the business and human rights project that is currently underway in the third phase. The first one is of course, the one that was already mentioned on Prouty as well, uh, on national action plans. We started uh, through this road in 2011 with the EU strategy for CSR, which was also supported by the UN Working Group. And we have seen a global race to some extent to national action plans pushed mainly by the EU. We have seen some developments outside of the EU. We have currently five countries that have national action plans, Colombia, of course, Chile, South Korea, uh, Kenya, and Thailand. But I have uh, one question that I would like to uh, leave on the floor today, and that is what is the real added value of national action plans, at least for our region and from our perspective? And let me give you two examples. One, from the Chilean national action plan. It clearly and explicitly states, for example, that um, that national action plan cannot address any other uh, regulatory measures or legislative measures. It is limited and that is a function of a different power. However, uh, it is still considering, it says so, it is still considering what it can be done about that one. So that's an, already a red flag. Nothing in terms of uh, legislation uh, with the effects on uh, uh, regulation on businesses and access to remedy. Second example from the Argentinian uh, event on National Action Plans, Frauke, you were there as well. I was moderating this panel and I asked a uh, secretary of a court, uh, a federal court in Argentina, what do you think will be the next step in 2024 if this plan gets adopted and you have to renew it? And he said to me, nothing at all. This will not affect our work because the judiciary is absolutely uh, irrelevant for the purpose of this National Action Plan. So that's already a second red flag that is important to recognize. In addition to this, business response has been uh, somehow, um, well, I would like to say just interesting. Within the EU, uh, UN, sorry, uh, treaty negotiations, for example, the International Organization of Employers uh, repeatedly states that national action plans are the way to go and that they support fully the development of national, of national action plans. But when we look at the ground, when we look at Latin America especially, we see that in many cases, I cannot say all cases, but in many cases, there has been a fierce opposition of businesses, even to public policies. We're not speaking about legislation, and we're definitely not speaking about access to remedy. So that is already another red flag that is very important. How do we have this global conversation between one party saying at the global level, yes, we want NAPs, and the other parties on the ground saying, not really. Let's uh, try to think of something else. There have been some important challenges in terms of expectations of achievement. Uh, and within the continuum of regulation, public policies are, in my view at least, at the lowest end of fostering change, especially on the ground and especially in countries that need this uh, so much. And finally, on the NAP phase, um, we see uh, 
across the world, I guess, that voluntary alignment of companies to these uh, international standards is an expectation, but it, is, uh, it has provided so far insatisfactory results. Companies everywhere are, are still guided by legislation. This takes me to my second point, which is the due diligence phase that we are currently living in. And this is something Gus already uh, mentioned, so I will not repeat that. We have the French law on the devoir de vigilance. We have other EU uh, legislations or regulations that address different elements that are important, of course. And we see some developments even in terms of access to remedy. We have the British uh, courts that are advancing this point. Other courts, including the Dutch courts, who are working on this type of cases with some interesting results. But something that is also clear is that judgments are not lineal. And there are important contradictions even between European jurisdictions. And this is a discussion I had with Olivier de Schutter last uh, year in the treaty session, where we discussed how the Vedanta case, that is so famously known, had a very interesting position on, for example, uh, the publicity of corporate standards and how they bind the parent company. And we have the uh, um, Versailles Court, Court of Appeals addressing the Jerusalem tramway case, where it said exactly the opposite four or five years before. So we have two interesting and contradictory positions from courts that are relevant. Latin America is not moving forward uh, so far in terms of legislation. That is very clear. But also it is very clear that uh, judiciaries are addressing progressively the link between due diligence and remedy. And that is something that is very important. In a recent OECHR report, uh, that addressed over 150 cases in four countries, it was clear that this is a clear tendency. And this uh, highlights some potential for the region as well. Uh, looking at uh, the case of the French law, for example, and this is something that would lead me to my uh, final remarks, and I know we have, I have about three and a half minutes more. Um, the French law has been very widely um, praised because it is the first legislative attempt to address, address uh, thoroughly, to some extent at least, the idea of due diligence. However, there are some questions about whether it has been an early success or if there are some pieces missing from this. NGO reports, for example, submit that 27% of companies covered by the vigilance law have not complied, and this is a report from two days ago, uh, and this even in a strong rule of law country. And we don't talk about small uh, French businesses, we talk about big multinationals. And also, uh, compliance has been criticized with this law because there is uncertainty about the law, insufficient transparency of who is covered by the law, and a lack of guidance from the French government. So that leads me to a third point, which I would like to call the global remedy phase. And uh, I will probably need one more minute, just for your knowledge. And I would like to uh, share with you one case that highlights the current risks in terms of the EU proposal to adopt legislation. Uh, there is a case called the Couchitan case uh, that involves uh, Electricité de France, the French state-owned enterprise. Well, it's not entirely state-owned, but there is a strong link with the state, which would be in principle covered by the French law on the duty of vigilance, which operates a wind farm in Oaxaca, Mexico, in southern Mexico, through a Mexican company owned by EDF and created for this purpose. The farm is located in the territory of indigenous peoples, which implies the need to conduct free prior and informed consultation and perhaps to obtain consent. In principle, the French parent company should have added this project to its mapping, perhaps it did, I'm not currently sure about that point, and its subsidiary would have been expected to act on this since 2018 when the law came into force to prevent human rights abuses in Oaxaca from a French SOE. However, the indigenous population claims not to have been consulted, and EDF, Electricité de France, argues that its operation is in full compliance with the Mexican legal framework, which has not yet adopted a law in consultation, it's been a political issue and also some opposition from indigenous communities. The question I would like to uh, raise here is how much did the French law change for the indigenous group in Mexico in terms of prevention or in terms of reparation? This is a pending case, so we will see. We don't have a full answer yet. And this leads me to uh, two comments, short comments, two questions, and one final remark. My first comment, 
the level of knowledge and commitment to RBC standards between headquarters in Europe and other uh, global North countries and country operations are entirely different. And it relates to legal culture. It's not necessarily just about the global standard set up by the parent company. This leads us to one big point, which is the uh, confrontation between global corporate standards on the one hand and the reality of domestic jurisdictions in host states. And this leads us also to the famous uh, saying, when in Rome, act like the Romans do. Second comment. Um, especially with the EU due diligence initiative, there is a palpable risk of repeating the same formula that is so well known in business and human rights, strong homestead regulations and host state neglect. This is a risk that has to be considered when developing this initiative. Two questions. How is the EU contemplating that companies incorporated in a third country will react to conflicting norms between home and host states? or even to the absence of norms in its place of operation? And what is the actual potential of the effects of legislation beyond the Mediterranean? And my second question is access to remedy, private international law, and the consolidation of the proper center of principle a way to go? Is a global and realistic access to remedy the new BHR frontier? And this leads me to one final remark. I said I would speak about the treaty, so I left this for the last uh, uh, second. The UN treaty negotiation is a theater where the EU has very good tickets, but it still needs to find its seats. Pressing need, there is a pressing need to seriously engage in its development. And one thing that is very important to consider, discussion and negotiation are not ratification and would set the stage to move from a regional development, a European development, which is obviously welcome. It's not something that we can ignore and it is obviously something that will lead the way but uh, it will set the stage to move to a global commitment to homogeneous legal expectations of responsible business conduct. And this means that full support to the UNGPs imply leaving no stone unturned. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Humberto, for this uh, wonderful um, wrap up um, expert view on, on Latin America. Um, I think what you've mentioned is kind of the <clears throat> consequence on what um, Frauke already said, the discrepancies between global standards and local norms are still really strong in Latin America. And this is not only as concerns the legislation, um, but the legislations or the differences um, entail other problems like the jurisdiction problems, where does legal trials um, yeah, are, are carried out in which countries of the world. Um, I think it's not that complicated if you really have a relationship of subsidiary and, and mother company. But if we, for example, can talk a bit later on the kick trial in, in Germany, where there wasn't a direct corporate relations, I think really um, things get really complicated. And there are other questions which will uh, have to be um, shed light on after um, if we have um, yeah, cleared up, um, shed light on, on the legislation questions. Um, now, before I will give the floor to Carolina uh, Olarte, I would like to remind uh, the participants of this webinar, also um, the participants watching um, or attending the seminar on Facebook, that we are really happy to receive your questions, uh, written questions in the chat for those who are connected uh, via Facebook and the ones connected via Zoom. Um, I will also very welcome to um, yeah, raise their hands um, to write in the chat that they would uh, speak after the last intervention because for the last minute we would love to discuss with uh, all of you um, about what we have just heard. But now uh, the floor will go pass on to Carolina Olarte. Carolina, please. Thank you very much, uh, Marie-Christine, for inviting me to this interesting panel and to the Conrad Adenauer Foundation for bringing together this great uh, working group on uh, business and human rights. Mm, in this presentation, I will approach the importance of an economic justice and business ethics perspective of human rights in Latin American states and economic actors' behavior and implementation of uh, human rights provisions. Mm, while corporations involved in business-related human rights abuses are frequently incorporated in the global north, incorporated abuses of human rights are said to occur more often in countries from the global south. 
where uh, those firms operate. As we all know, in the last years, corporations and especially transnational corporations have started to engage in activities that have traditionally been regarded as government activities, such as the provision of public services, social security, um, education. Some transnational corporations often assume this state-like role while often operating in countries with important government gaps and fail state responsibilities. Uh, at the same time, Global South countries tend to have a weak rule of law in comparison with countries from Global North. Uh, and in that sense, law is an improvable resource in countries of the Global South, as in some Latin American countries. That does not always meet the expectations of protection and legal security of citizens or foreigners. Um, in international law, the traditional protection of human rights is a state responsibility and companies don't have international responsibility for violations of internationally recognized human rights. Uh, this outcome contradicts relevant approaches from Global South movements that tend to exclude the state-centered legal perspective and that allow to consider other forms of uh, state building and other centers of uh, rulemaking. In this context, I will identify and discuss two scenarios that highlight important innovations regarding the business ethics approach in line with some aspects of economic justice to complement the limitations of legal responses and corporate accountability in the business and human rights context. In that regard, I would like to first highlight the scarce use of business ethics indicators to derive responsibility of foreign business corporations in the context of bilateral investment treaties. Second, I will move to a second scenario regarding the involvement of uh, private economic actors in collective memory and uh, the underlying risks of an unethical approach to peace building initiatives. So let's move to the first scenario, bilateral investment treaties and the international investment system for dispute settlements. Uh, Global South countries attract almost 59% of foreign investment and Latin American countries something like 13% uh, of foreign investment as for that 2019 World Investment Report. Mm, BITs are signed to promote economic development, uh, to greater legal protection of investors, which may be interest for Latin American development policies. BITs protect foreign investors, uh, grant them internationally enforceable rights, but generally do not impose obligations on foreign companies. The only one obliged is the state. Uh, one of the rare BITs that includes specific obligations for companies is the treaty between Morocco and Nigeria which states something like uh, investors in investments shall uphold human rights in the host state. This treaty obliged companies to respect uh, human rights and the environment and labor rights. Um, other BITs, as almost all BITs signed by Latin American countries, only include clauses where states are obliged to encourage companies to assume responsible business conduct. Therefore, the only ones that can be held accountable in an investment arbitration forum for the breach of their obligations are states, not companies. However, exceptionally, a few arbitral tribunals created by BITs have considered the clean hands doctrine in their interpretation of investor behavior. And this was done to study the admissibility of their claim and the extent of their legal protection. Mm, this doctrine has been used as a measure of the firm's social behavior, as a bar to jurisdiction, and as a bar to claim on the merits. In that regard, the foreign company cannot ask the state for an equitable uh, indemnization if it is itself in violation of a principle of equity. Interestingly, an arbitral tribunal used the so-called red flags as indicators of acts of corruption. Red flags are indicators of practice of corruption, which are referred to in the in, this, in reports of business ethics. So although there are some aspects of ethics that could be considered in international investment arbitration, the limits of traditional international investment law exclude companies as subjects obliged to respect human rights and thus do not allow to derive legal and ethical obligations for business conduct. Therefore, an approach from business ethics and economic justice would be a scenario that would complement the limits of the law and could be perfectly articulated with business and the human rights provisions. 
Mm, now let's move to the second scenario, collective memory and the involvement of private economic actors. Mm, there is a very limited international practice on the role of economic actors in armed conflicts and the limited role of business corporations in transitional justice process usually conducted in global south countries such as Liberia, El Salvador, Uruguay, Rwanda and others. Mm, despite this, the last peace agreement signed between Colombia and the FARC guerrilla established the Truth Commission. The Commission's mandate included uh, the identification of the different ways in which the conflict affected, among others, farmers, livestock merchants, businessmen, and businesswomen. At the same time, the business sector can contribute from its vision to what happened and its participation would be an essential element to improve collective understanding of the conflict complexity. Mm, collective memory can be constructed by commemorations, public recognition of victims, memorial, and the historical memory exercise. These exercises are allowed allow victims to face society, to share their history, and to progress collectively in overcoming trauma. Mm, the business sector, with some exceptions, has neglected the de its decisive role in the construction of collective memory as a mechanism to contribute to peace building and reconciliation. However, many studies have shown the decisive implications of corporations on gross violation in human rights uh, in the Colombian armed conflict. Thus, the private sector participation in the transitional justice process in Colombia is decisive to restoring minimal dignity to victims and reconciliation. In Colombia, there are several cases where the business sector has been part of process and initiatives for peace building and reconciliation. There are cases where companies have developed projects for labor and social inclusion of former armed conflict actors. Additionally, there are other cases where companies have supported process to improve infrastructure, to strengthen institutions, and to protect the environment and culture. Many of these initiatives are of social economic, uh, but however, peace building also needs initiatives that go beyond the purely material contributions and allow to elaborate on the past. Economic actors have a fundamental role to ensure remedy to human rights violations through their contribution, for instance, to collective memory. This form of remedy should be linked to the third UNGP pillar, access to remedy. Uh, but the UNGP as a soft law instrument has its own limits for an ethical understanding of the conflict. Some people consider that one of the main critiques of the UNGP framework is that it encourages corporations to honor human rights obligations in order to avoid hurting its profits profits, defending a business case, and uh, protecting its reputation. Mm, it is feared that this pragmatic approach, and I quote, reinforced the instrumentalist utilitarian thinking, which gave rise to the problems in the first place, and entrenched the business logic of profit maximization even more, unquote. Given this, uh, it is valid to ask in the case that companies participate voluntarily in collective memory projects first how to avoid memory exercise from becoming a hegemonic struggle. Uh, second, how to avoid the manipulative use of partial accounts of the past, and how to avoid the abuse of business and human rights remedy to bypass accountability, or to guarantee that memory initiatives and reconciliation uh, it, uh, with self-regarding and other regarding motivations as a condemnation of the combination of private and public wealth, and promoting remedy with the scope of uh, transformative justice in somehow to warrant an ethical approach into collective memory exercise. The blending of remedy, as it is conceived in the UNGPs, with business ethics and economic justice could be a, a good answer. So these two scenarios demonstrate that positive law from conventional and state-centered perspective has its own important limits to apprehend some realities in the Latin American context regarding business ethics and economic justice. Nevertheless, the conclusions of the line, this short analysis are uh, a more BHR holistic approach from states and corporations is necessary in the complex and power asymmetrical Latin American context. It is important to avoid corporate responsibility and the instrumentalization uh, as in the field building scenarios by business interests different from a holistic and comprehensive vision of wealth creation, business ethics, and the economic justice. Thank you very much and I look forward for your comments. Thank you very much Carolina for being so compliant uh, with the time and for this excellent um, intervention. intervention. 
uh, which really complements um, the other intervention on, on stressing two other major problems um, in the business and human rights discussion. First, the one that um, on an international law perspective, the only uh, ones who can be held liable are the states, um, and we really uh, need to see um, how we can construct the liability of, um, of companies. Um, I think there are already some important steps and um, also jurisdiction um, um, in this regard. For example, some sentences of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights who really um, are um, yeah, strengthening um, the responsibility of the state for omission in, in due diligence, for example, um, with respect um, to the compliance to um, indigenous people's rights, there's quite a lot of legislation at uh, the jurisdiction, sorry. And another important aspect, uh, which is obviously typical for the situation in Colombia at the moment, which is the responsibility of economic, um, economic actors in trans transitional justice situations. Um, there were quite a few sentences <clears throat> before the uh, special jurisdiction for peace dealing with the question, for example, if third party actors can be parties um, before the special um, jurisdiction. And I think this question will um, yeah, occupy, uh, help, um, hold Colombia up, occupied for some years more, but not only Colombia. I think it's only, um, it's also a very relevant part of the discussion um, on business and human rights all around the world. I think with this, um, we can um, go to first questions. Uh, we have somebody in the chat who is uh, very active, John Griffiths. Um, I would like to read um, some of his remarks and questions so we can maybe start the discussion. So the first one, uh, Tom Griffiths is for Forest and People Program of the Netherlands and the UK. He says, we see growing momentum for mandatory corporate human rights due diligence legislation in the EU countries and are possibly for the EU trade bloc. Um, this is on the demand side legislation, le legislation being considered and put forward by DG Justice. What is the potential for national legislation on mandatory human rights and due diligence in Latin American countries and this uh, with respect to supply, supply side legislation? I'm very sorry. So maybe we can start uh, with this first question um, and give the floor to our um, European speakers. And then I can see who else would like uh, to intervene. I don't know who would like shall, to. Shall, shall I give it a try? I'm looking at the uh, at the questions as we. Uh, uh, it's also oh, well. First of all, on, on any due diligence, uh, I think the easy part of the answer would be that there is a reporting uh, assumption as part of the uh, five-step framework, which was agreed. Uh, but at the level of OECD, by all OECD members, uh, including a number of uh, uh, member, uh, member OECD members from Latin America. So uh, if one ever has either a, a voluntary or a mandatory due diligence, has have this transparency aspect. And indeed, uh, should the EU ever get to the point of uh, adopting, uh, I would say, cross-sectoral mandatory due diligence, the question will certainly come up in relations with uh, trading partners, just uh, uh, because it's, it is, at the end of the day, also a level, level playing field argument. And uh, uh, already now, uh, uh, operators from outside the EU will be affected, uh, just one example, by the mandatory due diligence requirements under our conflict minerals regulation, uh, uh, whether it's outside EU smelters or refiners, or in, in case of lack of upstream due diligence, due diligence guarantees, they will be affected. But uh, if we have a mandatory requirement, also if, if there are major operations by, by subsidiaries of, 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 for instance, Mexican investors, they will be operating in the EU and will therefore also be covered by EU legislation. So again, uh, it, it is not a, a very operational issue yet under our uh, implementation of trade and sustainability development chapters, but it is an issue that is there. Uh, this issue will simply not go away. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, anybody else would like to comment on the first question? Frau, your piece. 
Uh, yes, thank you, uh, and, and thank you for, for that question. Uh, not, not very easy to, to answer that question, I would say. Uh, I can give you some insights maybe from, from my experience now working in this project uh, in the region for the past year and a half. Uh, I mean, I would definitely, uh, first of all, align obviously with, with what Chris um, Hautan was saying about the developments in the EU that definitely obviously will, because multinationals and different suppliers and factories based in the region, which will trickle down. So I think that that is also what I tried to explain in terms of the importance of um, of, of the incentive basically for companies to comply with it. now. I think that the issue of having, um, I mean, mandatory supply chain due diligence regulation in lack countries, uh, I have to, I have to admit that I think there, I, I think in order to do that efficiently, there's still a number of steps that need to be taken in in Latin American countries, and I, I do not, uh, in the experience that I have in the nine working in the nine countries for the past year and a half see that that there is uptake um, specifically. What do I mean in terms of the other steps? I mean, as I was saying also in my intervention, I think there are a number of, of basic premises that, that will need to happen before uh, a discussion on mandatory supply chain due diligence could take place. I mean, first of all, as I was saying, there is a, there is a main issue in terms of there's a good legal framework in place, uh, generally in Latin America, that underpins responsible business conduct, yet the main issue is effective enforcement. So, I mean, that is a, a problem that, that will need, to, I mean, a monetary human rights due diligence will not solve that problem. So I think we need to be very clear about that. Then a second point is, um, uh, is, is the issue of the national action plans on business and human rights. I mean, I do think that that is, uh, uh, I mean, I think Umberto raised some interesting points on how useful is it to have an app. Uh, uh, but I mean, we only for the moment has, have two countries in the region that have an app and it is a way in order to get business and stakeholders together around this agenda. So if you want to have effective enforcement of a human rights due diligence like, uh, legislation, I mean, having first in place a, an app uh, that, that works for the different parties, I think, would also be a, a stepping stone towards, uh, towards, towards that. Uh, and lastly, I mean, as I was saying, also national contact points are uh, in place in the different countries, yet there a lot can be done in order to strengthen the way that they're working. I think there are a lot of things that, that will need to be done um, before we, we could efficiently talk about the developing a human rights uh, due diligence legislation in, uh, in the region. And, and from my experience uh, in the region, speaking to the different governments and to the different business stakeholders, um, but also civil society and the trade union side, it is not a topic uh, at the moment to think about national uh, uh, mandatory due diligence legislation um, and actually what uh, I see for example in the process in Peru, Peru is, is quite advanced in developing in that process is that actually business organizations fear that the NAP process will uh, will um, establish mandatory due diligence uh, legislation and there's a, a lot of effort being done in order to try to demystify that that is not the purpose of, of the NAP but there's a lot of there's a lot of concern on the business community I mean, right or wrongfully so, but there there is a lot of uh, a, a lot of work that will need to be be done to bring uh, to bring stakeholders together on on this topic. Thank you very much, uh, Frauke. That helps a lot. Um, although I think we always come back to the crucial question: um, Well, the diagnostic this is um, the same um, everywhere that the real problem is implementation and enforcement. So um, the key question would be: um, How do we get Latin American countries to implement and enforce um, the um, global or EU legislation or have uh, stricter laws? Uh, do we have to work more with, with, in, with incentives? Or I think you mentioned this in your intervention, maybe we should uh, work more on empirical studies showing that um, um, enterprises and companies who actually stick to the norms have real business advantages because states um, will prefer them in contracting them on um, trans transport or cross-border uh, um, negotiations and, and trade. Um, that would be my question. Maybe we can um, talk on this a little bit further, but um, before we go to another answer round, I would like to read two more questions. They're both from Peru at the moment. Uh, first, the one is from Jenny Vento. 
She's asking, what do you think about the possibility of including differentiated incentives, like a reduction of taxes, for example, so that companies less resilient, medium and small companies, implement the UN guiding principles and carry out due diligence in Latin America? And how can Latin American governments make effective human rights due diligence in economies with high level of labor informality, about 80% in Peru, which is even worse than in other countries, and even illegal activities? And there's another question um, from a Peruvian who lives in Colombia because he works with the Rule of Law Blog Program for Latin America, Miguel Barbosa. He asks, what would be the path to achieve coherent legislation at the national level for companies to fulfill their due diligence duty? For example, in Peru, the legislation on environmental, indigenous and extractive issues does not seem to dialogue with each other to achieve full respect of human rights. I think in this matter, in this regard, Peru is not the only country who's facing this kind of difficulty. Maybe we can start a second answer round uh, with these questions. I don't know who wants to take the floor first. Humberto. Thank you, Mary Christine. Actually, I will uh, engage first in relation to the first question. Let me just reread it because <laughs> with these uh, elements, I got a bit distracted. Um, about the potential for national legislation. Well, here's two, two impressions. Number one, I do believe that there are many elements of due diligence already in place, not just in Latin America and Europe as well. I mean, uh, speaking about due diligence as a mechanism for prevention uh, refers directly to the duty to do no harm as it's inscribed in the UNGPs, and that is already well established in civil liability, in civil legislation all over the world, basically. Uh, following the French model. So that is not really an issue. If we think of due diligence as something that requires reporting, which in my view is an additional uh, benefit of uh, prevention or other mechanisms, that is also very good, but that is not necessarily what would be uh, possible here. Frauke raises, and you as well, a very good point. Implementation will always be an issue. But as long as we have the tools to make sure that companies understand, on the one hand, that they have already a duty to prevent uh, harm to others as a result of their operations, and in some cases, as a result of their business activities or business relationships, uh, that is already uh, gaining some, uh, allows us to gain some ground. Uh, I do believe that legislation in this regard would not necessarily uh, work if it is the same as what is being uh, thought of in Europe. And I don't know yet what is being thought of in Europe, but I guess it's something that covers all of these elements as the report that were released two weeks ago uh, illustrate, for example, different options of monitoring, reporting, and prevention, of course, and access to remedy. So uh, that's one point, and that is a very important point. Uh, it is uh, futile, I think, to, um, to speak about a need for a specific legislation addressing this when we already have in place the tools to use this. But it's very important that everyone uh, in government and in the business sector understand that there is already all of this logic and in some cases even criminal liability uh, for uh, legal persons. So that's one. Two, um, the idea of uh, how to enhance this development is something that I'm seeing very clearly. And of course, the Mexican context is not necessarily the same as the rest of Latin America. And I'm very conscious of that, especially with our neighbors in the North. But um, one thing is trade agreements and investment agreements are a good tool to further national, national legislation and national understanding of these issues. So I would suggest that with the upper hand that uh, the economic policies of the EU have, it is something worth considering beyond just the idea of NAPs, because NAPs have a lot of value, but they have limited effect in countries where they are regarded as only a government program and nothing else. A government program, not a state program, but limited to you know political timeframes. Now, uh, very quickly on the other question um, by Jenny, uh, the idea of differentiated incentives, I believe that could work very well uh, also for uh, SMEs, uh, it is necessary for them to engage, knowing as well that, well, this means that they will not escape liability if they produce harm, not necessarily escape liability if they uh, cause harm to other parties. 
but it is something that is worth considering. And the idea of informality, that is something that I was actually looking forward to hearing Frauke respond to, uh, because I know you have all the information. That's a, that's a very difficult question. <laughs> um, uh, on, on, on the issue of informality, um, um, I think we, we need to do much more work uh, on this uh, in terms of what this, what this means. Uh, I mean, we've done a lot of work uh, already, um, uh, I mean, on, on, a, on a small scale in terms of, you know, arsenal and small scale miners, which many times are informal and how this links to the due diligence process because they're feeding into a bigger supply chain. So, uh, I mean, there, there's, there's a lot of work that has been done very concentrated in that area. But I think across, uh, across, uh, across the sectors and across Latin America, we need to do much more. Uh, I think it's also uh, a matter of making businesses, even formal businesses in Latin America, understand that even though they themselves are formal, that they might be sourcing from, supplying to, or subcontracting to other business entities, even if they're very, very micro, small, or own account workers, which are informal, and that that uh, relieves a responsibility on on that business to make sure that that um, that uh, uh, basic human rights, environmental, and labor rights are respected. So it's a uh, I mean, it, it's it's a rather high level answer at this stage, but it's definitely something which I, I hope that through the project we'll be able to 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 work more on is, is really trying to uh, provide much more hands on tools and practical guidance to uh, uh, companies and governments on how they can ensure um, the respect of RBC standards also in the informal sector. Because obviously we would like to pull as much as possible these companies into formality, but at the same time, we also need to recognize that that might not always be feasible and that there's still a link also to international supply chains and there's still the importance of complying with some basic principles. So I, yeah, I would, I would say this would be my preliminary answer on this difficult question, but something that I hope we'll definitely have more clarity on as we are advancing our, our work in the region. Thank you. Very good question. The, the only thing that I might just quickly wanted to ask about, about incentives. Um, I think that's a really good point as well. Thank you. Thank you for raising it. Um, uh, and I think here it's also uh, it, it's it's interesting to look at a range of issues and and where we're trying to work more and more with governments to show them that there's a lot they can do to promote and incentivize RBC. For example, for public procurement. I mean, uh, and public procurement is a in very important part of, of the state budget. Uh, and through giving contracts to companies and small companies or, or big companies that are com complying with certain RBC standards and actually actively checking that is a way to, and give them points in the tendering process, is a way to, to incentivize uh, responsible business conduct. The same is through, through state-owned enterprises, which can, uh, companies, government companies themselves should, should lead by example on these issues. So, um, and, and what is also quite interesting is that you, you've seen in the whole context of the COVID-19 crisis, we didn't get a chance to much talk about it, but what's also interesting to see is that governments, some governments have taken quite bold steps to say, look, we're only giving uh, support to companies that are uh, not based in tax havens, for example, or that are complying with certain environmental um, uh, environmental conditions. So I think that that's really interesting to 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 work more with Latin American countries on 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 optimizing this this space on of incentives. Thanks. Very good questions. Thank you. I was really thinking of the same thing on public procurement because before I went to Latin America, I had the luck to work as an EU antitrust and competition lawyer. And there in uh, in Germany, for example, if somebody violates antitrust law, he just cannot participate in public procurement processes. And I think this is one of the most effective mechanisms to actually ensure that people comply uh, with antitrust laws. Sometimes it's even more effective than um, a monetary fine. Just to react on a, a number of questions, including the ones I can see from Antonio Guzman and the Maria Luque. Uh, exactly. That, indeed, well, I'm not the expert on tort law. The only thing I know of was that we did not uh, adopt the Rome II uh, regulation without uh, a purpose, uh, establishing the applicable law for tort cases, including the tort cases related to human rights infringement. So. I, num I assume there is a, a, de a, a, a degree of, 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 of truth to the, the question. 
perhaps on due diligence to demystify. I mean, due diligence at the end of the day is a process. Uh, uh, like, uh, uh, like Humberto also said, it's, it's preventing, it's avoiding, it's mitigating risks uh, uh, and adverse impact in one's uh, supply chain. It is not, and I always give the example of the conflict minerals regulation in the EU, the regulation in itself is not an absolute guarantee that there will be no metals or minerals imported that by any chance have contributed to fueling conflict. It's only that companies need to do their damn well best to avoid that they're doing it. So in French law, it's an, uh, rather an obligation of, of effort uh, than an absolute result. And it's also one uh, uh, with which the, uh, there is a, a bit of an, uh, a complicated phrase in our regulation saying, well, this regulation doesn't deal with sanctions, uh, that comes later. Uh, but national, con uh, national uh, uh, responsible authorities for the implementation of the regulation will have to define at some point what kind of national legislation uh, in in case of uh, really deliberate avoidance to do anything uh, are uh, uh, on on due diligence are applicable so we are again we are struggling with that concept and again it, the the conflict minerals regulation uh, except Putting aside our timber regulation is our first uh, EU-wide, with uh, I'll come to the extraterritorial effect, uh, legislation on mandatory due diligence, and we will only know how that will actually operate. Again, I'm I'm trying to put a bit of water on all those that are too enthusiastic about due diligence. We are indeed we are dealing with a complicated regulation. Just to give you an example. Together with DG Trade, we published guidance on what are conflict affected and high risk areas. Where do your alarm bells or so called red flags have to go off as a company uh, to see? Uh, and what and, 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 and how can you be judged afterwards if there was a neglect? And then on extraterritorial effect, not really, but we, we of course struggled with the issue when the real choke point where you can still find out where. Um, where the input comes from is the refinery and most of the refinery, I'm oh, sorry, the smelters, refinery is only gold, but most of the smelters are located outside the EU. Most of them are even in fact two thirds in Asia or which another two thirds I think in, in China. So, uh, but the impact of our regulation, the effect is definitely also on those smelters because they will have to come up with a, the necessary documentation for the downstream uh, uh, buyers. So again, uh, probably too difficult to speak of extraterritorial obligations, but extraterritorial impacts, no doubt, as with all legislation we adopt, if the, le this legislation includes imports. And we have all kinds of uh, ideas, of course, floating on in other areas, uh, uh, like the, the carbon adjustment tax, uh, just name one favorite uh, subject of discussion uh, these days. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Hus. Um, I think you already addressed some questions um, which I don't need to read anymore um, because some of the followers in Facebook might not have gotten the question, but I think from your answers, we already, you already shed light on the questions. I think uh, there's a second one for Humberto, and maybe this is also the last one because we are already a little bit against the time. Um, I don't know, uh, I will read it and, um, and when adding um, the appropriate commentary of Humberto Cantu, how is the EU proposal expect to address extra uh, territorial obligation on the EU members? Uh, I don't know if you, Humberto, uh, you want to uh, comment on this as well. I'm not sure I want to comment, but I will try. Um, let me uh, give it a try. Um, Extraterritorial obligations, that is a very difficult uh, point yeah. that was just mentioned. And I wanted to raise something that came to my mind that was within the discussions of the, that we had uh, for the uh, report of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights on its report on BHR, precisely. And that was the idea, and I was discussing this with Florencia, who is present uh, here today, and who wrote a very good blog about it, actually, um, on uh, the topic of 
what does it mean to address either control or influence? Are we speaking about controlling the actions of other uh, subjects outside of the uh, jurisdiction? Or are we talking about exerting influence over those actors? That is addressed, in my view, very interestingly in, in the report of the Inter-American Commission. It introduces a separate nuance in the discussion on public international law on this topic, because it's, of course, not the same to speak about armed forces than to speak about a business that is absolutely um, capable of making its own decisions, even against regulation or against the law. So I think if we think of the idea of influence rather than control, um, there may be a possibility for extraterritorial obligations to try to influence, but again, acknowledging that it will not be uh, up to the state to ensure business compliance with that. Uh, it's of course a very theoretical response, uh, and uh, I would like to see that uh, in some practical way, but for the time being, that's what I can uh, contribute to that point. And just very briefly about uh, Miguel's question on tort law. Uh, I hope this report by OECHR will come out soon, but okay. yeah, one very interesting conclusion is that um, there is a legislative tendency in South America, I'm not saying Latin America, but in four countries at least, where there are legislative uh, references to uh, the reversal of the burden of proof, a dynamic burden of proof, as it's called. So that is something that is actually very important for tort law. And I think from that report, we can see that the system itself works. It will not necessarily always work, but it, because it depends on the arguments of the parties, the facts of the case and everything else. But I think there is a system that can be used if we use it correctly. So that's uh, something that I encourage everyone to think about actually. Thank you very much, uh, Humberto. I think with this um, last uh, statement, in this very complicated topic of extraterritorial obligations, we, we come to an end, or we have to come to an end. Also, I would love to uh, discuss ours more because there's some really, really interesting questions which we cannot yeah, completely um, shed light on this one hour and a half uh, which we had to discuss. Um, but hopefully we can discuss, um, continue the dialogue in the future or in Latin America or in Europe. Um, and hopefully it can be presential because um, yeah, all the webinars are very good, but I think uh, presential meetings are always still better. And nevertheless, um, I would um, like to give a very big thank you to our speakers today, to Frauke, to Hus, to Umberto and to Carolina. Unfortunately, Carolina's internet broke down and um, this is, an unfortunate consequence of uh, yeah the overuse of internet in Bogota in the last months because uh, we've been in quarantine for more than three uh, months now. But uh, yeah, um, she um, sends her thank you and her regards to to everybody. Thank you, of course, to everybody who has listened to us to the our Latin American expert group and because today this is our last a part of our virtual dialogue program for uh, thank you for attending for uh, thank you for participating i think it was very interesting and with this of course also thank you to caroline lubrich um, from cas in brussels because i would like to say goodbye to everybody a uh, good evening or still good day and hope to see you soon thank you very much Don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn for updates on our work. You can find the links in the description. We are looking forward to seeing you again at our next podcast episode.